So I started dancing at a very young age. I think I was five, um, following my brother, uh, who was following my sister. They were a bit closer in age, so I came on a lot later. And it was the thing we did on a Saturday. We just went to dance class. And at some point, um, we, there was a thought that we might move from Hull to Leeds. And so um, somebody had said to my mother that there was a really good teacher in Leeds and maybe we should go to that teacher. And so we, we went to that teacher and actually we never moved to Leeds. So we stayed in Hull, but started going to this teacher. And this teacher uh, called Jean Pierce was a very much a, a, what you'd call a theatrical type dance teacher now. And so she did all forms of dancing, um, really tap, what they used to call modern song and dance, all of those things, and ballet a little bit, but she actually, well, that wasn't her speciality. And uh, so we got to do lots of different things. My brother was in, uh, and, and actually I was in a show called Junior Showtime that was on television at one point. And then they were casting for a movie that Alan Parker, who's just actually recently died, um, and uh, called Bugsy Malone. And it was going to be a singing, dancing children's musical that was based around a, a gangster story. Um, and so we auditioned for that and both Michael and I are in that movie. So that was our claim to fame. And, uh, and actually, when people talk about as a young boy, whether I was ever teased at school for being a dancer or wanted to do that, I always say, actually, I never had any of that. And I think part of it was because it was, um, de it, we seemed being quite cool, being in a movie and being on television. And so that really worked well for us. And then just, things sort of collided where um, we started to get more interested in ballet. Our teacher actually recommended somebody in Hull, uh, Vera Skelton, if we wanted to do some more serious ballet. And also at that time, then Michael got a scholarship to the RED, um, which was in York, and that was with the amazing teacher Louise Brown. I actually went with her for a few months. I got the scholarship the next year, but then went on to White Lodge. And then also David Gale started uh, actually, there weren't even summer schools at the beginning. They were sort of just winter courses, Easter courses in Ilkley. And that's where we first really saw these amazing people from the, you know, the world of ballet. You know, everybody from uh, Alicia Markova, Anton Dolin, Danila Veronova, I could go on, you know, the names, plus a lot of teachers from the Royal Ballet and the Royal Ballet School. And it was there that um, I, when they first did the first, um, uh, summer school, which was residential, they had a scholarship uh, the day, uh, and put it in the name of David Blair. And actually, I won that scholarship. So I was the first one to win that. And so I had amazing time. And uh, there was, uh, I remember doing lots of things uh, as well as the dance classes. Baronova, I remember Baronova saying to me, Come on, dance like Barishnikov, come down the room. You know, of course, I didn't even know who Barishnikov was at that time. Um, but, and Anton Dolin, you know. Um, even took me shopping in antique shops. To, and I remember him telling me about how you, you distinguish a real pearl from a, a, a fake one and little things like that. And I think he was probably um, remembering his times at you know, Diaghilev and all of those, passing down, you know, teaching people things about life as well as dance. And while I was there, uh, a notation teacher from the Royal Ballet School said to my mother, oh, have you thought about your son going to the Royal Ballet School? And she said, oh, yes, Michael is auditioning. And uh, she said, oh, well, that's good, but what about the other one? And she said, oh, well, no, he does song and dance, tap and all of that. And uh, so that's where the idea came. My parents were very sort of practical and just said, would you like to do this? And even though I was only the age 11, I, I said, yeah, I think I would. So I auditioned and interestingly, Michael and I both joined the Royal Ballet School at the same time. Michael to the upper school and me to the lower school. I actually went into year two, so I only did four years at White Lodge. And at that first year, actually, Michael had Ronald Emblem as his teacher at the upper school and I had Ronald Emblem at the, at the, at the lower school. So it's interesting, that sort of trajectory. I had a great time at the Royal Ballet School in general and uh, had an amazing time where I, I uh, was a part of an exchange to the Royal Danish Ballet in my second year at the upper school. And that really sort of um, was, came around at the, a really good time. And really at the time I felt maybe a bit restricted by the Royal Ballet School and 
and it sort of freed me up and we did amazing classes there, amazing male teachers. I was taught by Eric Brunn and uh, myself and Jeremy Sheffield, who were at school together, came back and we looked like, you know, I think we'd grown up, to be honest. That was the main thing. And by that point, I'd started to grow. I was always small and I started to grow. And, uh, and then it was the last year at the school and there I was with Viviana Durante and Miyaka Yoshida and Errol Pickford. We were sort of uh, all graduating at the same time. And I was very lucky, Michael Soames sort of took me under his wing a little bit and uh, he uh, decided he'd make me into a good partner. And because uh, I, I was just growing and hadn't really done much partnering. And so he rehearsed Viviana and I for the Sleeping Beauty for the school show. And also I danced with Miyako in that as well. And uh, yeah, so it was an amazing time and uh, got offered, Michael was already in the Royal, uh, Sadler's Wells Royal Ballet and uh, Peter Wright offered me a job. So I joined the Sadler's Wells Royal Ballet in a long time ago, 1984, quite amazing. And uh, yeah, I had a wonderful time as, as the Sadler's Wells Royal Ballet, amazing director with Peter Wright. And he was very ambitious. Uh, maybe that's where I get it from he, now. He it was very encouraging with choreographers. Really, we did a lot of new work as well as those classics. So, um, and the company had just got gotten bigger really in the, that time. And so it was, uh, in a way, we thought at one point we were a victim of our own success because the company had grown and it, it sort of grew too big for Sadler's Wells at that time. It was the old Sadler's Wells. And so that's why the offer of the Birmingham uh, moving to Birmingham came along that really um, we were too big for for South as Wells. We used to come here to the Opera House and to perform all the classics because we couldn't do it at South as Wells. And yeah, very lucky to have the career I had. You know, I worked with Sir Fred um, on a ballet called Volz Nobler Sentimental. Also, um, that was where I worked with him really closely. I was also young in the Corps de Ballet when he used to come and rehearse. And then, of course, with Kenneth and uh, danced lots of his ballets and also in the new production of Romeo and Juliet with him. And, uh, and also, of course, Madame. And uh, Madame was quite amazing. I suppose that in my time, it felt like she was just this quite sweet older lady. I didn't really notice, know the, I wasn't nervous of her at all. And she liked boys much more than girls. And she particularly liked us because we were Irish, even though I was born in Yorkshire, had an Irish name. So she, she always knew who Michael and I were and was very um, supportive. And, uh, you know, amazing memories of dancing here for her 80th birthday. Um, we did Job here. Um, and uh, we had to, at that time, she was not very well. And they took us around to meet after we did Job. Michael was Satan, I was Elihu. And uh, she said she really enjoyed it. But we, I remember Michael and I looking and thinking, this is probably the last time we'll ever see her. And then about five months later, um, it always been a dream of hers to do it at the uh, Coventry Cathedral. And we did it there. And she was there making speeches and back to this, you know, strong woman. Uh, amazing. So fantastic. Uh, great time with Peter Wright as director. And then um, David Bindley took over. Of course, I'd worked with David quite a lot as a dancer already. And actually, I really enjoyed, I, I did five years as, with him as a director, and I really had a great time. I think um, at that, by that point, I'd got over the, the idea of everything had to be perfect, and I used to be very, very down on myself. If, you know, things didn't work technically, and, uh, you know, you'd always want to be, give your best performance. And uh, I think by the time David took over, I, was, I would have been 30 years old. And so I was more mature and realized there's more to a performance than just a pirouette going right or wrong. And it's all about living the character mainly. And so I did a lot of his big ballets and uh, had a great time there. I was around 35 years old uh, when I, I decided to stop dancing. I actually had been very lucky through my, my career. I'd, I had no injuries, really. And I always say, actually, now to dancers, it's actually probably not so lucky to have a career like that where you, you just keep on going. And especially in those days, there the wasn't the, the stages. You know, we didn't know about uh, sprung floors as much, all of those things. And so, you know, I really relentlessly danced for 
a long time. And so when I was about 33, I had a, no cartilage left in my knees, really. So I had um, a, what they called microfracture to try and create some soft, soft tissue and start to get things moving again. And I was determined to get back. And when I had the operation, actually, I, I remember waking up and the, the nurse in the room said, oh, you were the one that was the dancer. I hear you're not going to dance again, sir. So tough and going, forget that, I'm going to dance again. So I, I took about six months to get back. And uh, yeah, so I must have been actually, yeah, I was 33, 34. And um, when I got back, I could, I, I did start dancing again, but I realized that it was always going to be this thing. Oh, how am I feeling today? Am I going to be able to do this? Uh, you know, and I took myself out of certain things and then went back to other roles. And so I thought, you know, this is enough for me. While I was injured and while I was recovering from the operation, I thought this is the time to think about what I would like to do next. And I'd already, since we moved to Birmingham, been uh, sort of quite active in putting shows together, helping choreographic workshops as, as a sort of producer. I, I did some charity galas, you know, organizing them. And I really enjoyed that. And so I thought maybe that's what I would like to do. So I went to, um, uh, people were very kind to me. So. Uh, Christopher Norse, who had been the administrative director at the Sadler's Wells and Birmingham, he was then with Ron Bear, so uh, he said, come down and just hang out, work out with Ron Bear. So I spent probably about two months with them, did everything from stuffing envelopes, you know, um, it went on the education department, a bit of this, a bit of that, went on tour with them. And it was just interesting to see how a, a different company was run, having always known the Sadler's Wells Royal Ballet slash Birmingham. Anyway, came to, came to the decision, I thought it's year 2000, the theatre in Birmingham was closing, so we weren't going to do any performances there. We were going to New York, I thought what a better place to finish. No offence to Sunderland, but I thought it was a bit nicer to finish in New York. So I finished with Edward II there, and actually I did a, uh, that was my last full length ballet, and then in Chicago we had a triple bill and I was in that triple bill. So finished literally 20 years till uh, 20 years yesterday or a few days ago so yeah and um, while I was deciding to do that I, I when I was with Ron Bear, I thought you know maybe this sort of middle management thing is, uh, is something that I would like so company manager and actually at the S Birmingham there hadn't been a dancer ever do that but actually history here there had been at the in the Royal Ballet Peter Brownlee was a dancer who was the company manager for years so anyway I um, and again another person two people in Birmingham Derek Pennell and uh, Jackie Mystery helped me to find out what I how I could get more training and there wasn't the claw fellowship at the time but actually I sort of I, now looking back at it I made my own version of that and through their contacts got in touch with the Royal Shakespeare Company and so they invited me to join them on a sort of secondment really and uh, I would work in all the departments learning about how you take a company on tour, how you finance it, how you put uh, things together and education, marketing, all of those things and they were really, really kind to me. I loved it, had a great time. I literally stopped in Chicago on the Friday, flew back and started on the Monday and uh, did everything and they did one of their, they were taking one of their plays around into sort of um, leisure centers and you know the next thing I was helping wind up the seats and get everything sorted, did everything. Had a couple of really great people there, the company managers that really supported me and actually they offered me a job at the end of it so I worked with them for another six months and had a fantastic time and really loved it. It was so it was, there were so many similarities, but so different as well. Um, but then uh, the job was uh, advertised for uh, company manager in Birmingham. And so sort of the draw of the ballet and, you know, my own company as well. And so I went for that job and got it. And so spent three, four years, I think, as, you know, probably only three years actually as company manager there. Really enjoyed it. Um, we toured of course and and learnt a lot worked well with David and um, it was a different sort of job there I think um, it was very much um, 
about the logistics, getting everybody there, here, there, ev everywhere, you know, sort of told what to do and then make it happen. And then the job was advertised, the same job here, and I did wonder about it, um, thinking, you know, I may just change it to come to move back to London. But actually, it was quite a different job here, very much part of the senior management. So you were more around the decisions of that. And so I enjoyed the effect of, you know, working the, at that time. Now we've got a gang of whatever, but uh, it was always a Wednesday meeting. We used to call it the gang meeting. And it was myself, Ginetta Lawrence, Monica Mason, as the, she was the director by then, and Anthony Russell Roberts. So I had, uh, I, I love being part of the decision making. Of course, they were making the decisions, but I knew why the reasoning was. I thought it was a very smart way of doing it because then you're not just told, oh, do this. It, this is why we're doing this. And, you know, learning off all those three was fantastic. Anthony Russell Roberts is, was an amazing man. And, and he was, you know, coming to more towards the end of his career and was very generous and sort of said, why don't you do this? Why don't you try this? Why don't you sort this out? And, you know, so in the end, I was sort of, um, uh, you know, arranging the tours, deciding where we would go, all of those things. And, you know, so one time fairly early on, we were going to Mexico and then we were going somewhere else and that had fallen through. And so he's like, just find us somewhere to go. So I was literally like a a door-to-door -door salesman going, I'm, you know, I'm the Royal Ballet, would you like us? And managed to get in, in within sort of four months, get us to tour America as well. And so all of those things are fascinating and, and working with presenters and empresarios and all of those. So it was sort of a, even though I hadn't imagined it, it was nearly a natural progression that when Anthony left that I would apply for that job anyway. And so in 2009, I became the administrative director and uh, really had really great, great fun with that. Loved working with Monica and Janetta again and sort of came up with different things. So, uh, you know, I could see that it was my ideas coming forward. So things like as going to Cuba, I thought we had this amazing dancer, Carlos Acosta and Cuba and all its history. And wouldn't it be amazing if we went there? And it was sort of a germ of an idea uh, in 2008 and in 2009, we made it happen. An amazing experience. I went there four or five times to set it up. And uh, it was an incredible experience and, and something for the company to remember. Interestingly enough, we had to deal with swine flu when we were there as well. So that was another, another drama. And then also then just, you know, working with Tony Hall as well. That was a really great experience. And that's where the idea of bringing the company to the O2, um, you know, just thinking outside of the box and trying to create new audiences. And so we had a great success there. I think nearly 50,000 people saw us in, in three nights there. And it was incredible and uh, as something different. And then the job was coming up. Monica had said she was going to leave and um, had never thought about it. Uh, it, had, it was never the idea. And, the, you know, I think there maybe was uh, somebody that I thought might go for the job and I, would, I was really happy to support that person and, and make that happen. And, and then I know that person did, decided not to. And, then so, and a few people had said to me, have you not thought about it? And uh, so literally the day before the, the last signing in, actually I'd been, I was in Paris. I'd uh, been to see a, triple, a double bill there and I sat in this little hotel room and wrote my application and sent it off. And it's interesting because, it, of course, I knew I loved the job as an administrative director, though I always have a problem saying it. And, uh, and so I thought I had nothing to lose, really. But it's interesting, once you start to put together ideas for something like that, um, and the more interviews I had for the job, you know, as I went through the different stages of the process, the more I wanted it, you know, and I, I, I wouldn't have, you know, if I hadn't got it, I wouldn't have sort of flounced off, but I, uh, in disgust, but I, I think I would have found it hard because I'd, you know, you, when you suddenly start to think about how you'd like to do it, how you'd like to run it, what you'd like to do, um, it really became something that I was really passionate about. And uh, yeah, so I was very lucky and uh, was uh, appointed in 2011 to start in 2012. And I really took that year um, doing my old job, but also 
traveling as much as I could, seeing as many companies, seeing as many choreographers, and seeing the state of the world of ballet, really, in that time. Uh, so I can hardly believe I've been eight years the artistic director, or we call it director, but really it's uh, the artistic side. And it is, it's quite an interesting, uh, it's, the job has developed so much. I mean, interestingly, having worked with Janetta Lawrence, who worked with four directors in her time, and she always said how interesting it was seeing how the job had changed over those years, you know, and all the things that a director is, is you know, uh, meant to be in, in, in our world now. And uh, I have to say, somebody once said to me, um, it was about something else, and they were saying, if you haven't done what you want to do, or, or near as, damn it, in eight, 10 years, then you're never gonna do it. <laughs> so, and funny enough, reflecting on not even, the last couple of years, I've really felt the company is in a fantastic sp space. You know, companies naturally, you know, because of the way dancers come and go, directors change, choreographers come and go, and and so you know, companies go like this. That's the nature of it. Um, and but I do feel that we were really in such a great place. You know, these last couple of years, you know, some really fantastic works had, had joined, had been created for the company, and this whole new generation had joined all already the sort of ballet superstars that we had at the top of the company. So I feel um, that mixture of, of uh, uh, this new generation tackling, you know, and that last year when we did um, Sleeping Beauty and, you know, just, you know, one of the trickiest of ballets, really, and, and one that you think is a little tester, you know, put your finger out and test how, how we're doing. And I felt the, you know, not a, we had a spectacular first night, but then really the, the sort of 20 odd performances, the standard of those performances were fantastic. And then meanwhile doing, you know, creating new ballets and having these great choreographers, of course, Christopher and Wayne, and then, and then Crystal uh, coming in and being part of us. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, sort of in this last year, we had Kathy coming back and, and Pam Tanowitz. And so really feeling like a creative buzz around the place. So I feel, not to sit on one's laurels, but just to feel, okay, great, we've got here now, what's the next steps forward? And uh, sort of unfortunately then the pandemic hit and uh, I have repeated this story, but we did have, we had a fantastic first night of the first revival of the Swan Lake. And, um, and that same cast actually did the last show on the 12th of March here and uh, it was extraordinary and I think we all knew it. We'd, uh, f over the week we'd been talking to the company every day saying things are looking tough and the audience, it felt like the audience knew it and they did the most incredible, I mean literally from Marcelino Solo as Benno till you know obviously Marinella and Vadim but then the whole company at the end that, and it felt like the audience didn't want to let us go and we didn't want to let them go you know so it was quite uh, it was very even thinking about it now I feel emotional thinking about it because it will and we didn't know what we were going to and that weekend actually it was a weekend off and and I could see the news and everything and everybody was planning to come back in on the Monday and I just wrote an email to the company I said please don't come in today let's just see let's take stock for a minute because we hadn't a performance for a few days and I, but I came in and that was the night that they closed the place down. Near, near the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Ted Branson, lovely Ted Branson, who's director of um, Dutch National Ballet, he did an email and he copied in, I think, a hundred directors, ballet directors. And it was really fab because really they, I think it, they locked down before us and they, they were really in the middle of it just a little bit before. And so it was really great to have that. And that was so appreciated by so many of us. And then um, I've also been in touch with, um, there's a thing called Ballet USA, which is all basically the big American ballet companies. And so they invited me to go to that meeting. So I'm part of, I'm an American director for, for the pandemic. And uh, actually I love it because it's, I, you know, we're in very different situations, but it's, I think it's always great to share. And, uh, and you know, people that I've known now for quite a long time, you know, people, people we work closely with like Karen Kane, but also, and Kevin McKenzie, but also, um, 
you know, Stanton and, and uh, Miko and, and, you know, just the list goes on. And it's, it's really important to share. And we've done that with the English companies as well. So, the, the, you know, all of the sort of main dance companies have had meetings together. And it's really important to just um, be in it, as they say, together. It's been quite a challenge. Um, I think one of the extraordinary things was trying to keep the company feeling uh, a sense of togetherness. And so we did that, like many of us, thank God for technology. This is when the good side of it, though we all hate the word Zoom now, it, it was a godsend. And, uh, you know, being able to interact with each other has been, um, was amazing. And so we set up the classes, we set up the Pilates, we set up the strength and conditioning. We did uh, an update every day to just say where we are and, and just sharing as much as we could with each other. Meanwhile, I was, you know, in these long, long meetings. And if you think you could have that time back, you know, because half the things we talked about never happened. But it was also trying to keep our audience engaged with us as well. So we started the Friday premieres, which was bringing work that had been seen on, in cinemas and things like that, bringing them to the, you know, YouTube channel for free. And then just engaging with as many people as, can, as we can. And, Fantastically, one of our sponsors, O. Jebson, uh, paid for us to be able to send squares of lino from Harlequin. So everybody got their square of lino so they could actually rehearse in their space. And uh, I had said straight away, I did say, if you want to go home, please go home to dancers who lived outside of the country, you know, their families. And so quite a lot of people did. And I'm glad, uh, you know, we weren't sure how long it was going to last then, but I thought it was important if people did want to go home. And then, you know, as all that carried on for the many months, um, but, you know, then it was about getting people back in the building. And so we, we took the first, we came back in July. We had a couple of little uh, forays into the, to when the opera did their concerts. And so we had a couple of part of in that. Um, but then the, we wanted to get the company back in July. So they came in at that point, we weren't allowed to use the showers, the changing rooms. So people used to have to come in with their clothes on, their dance kit underneath, take off, do their class, and then go back home. And I, I remember seeing people, you know, it was so hot, wasn't it? And people were like sweating, like, and they're all in their clothes going, oh, I need a shower. But they all just were right on it from day one, as they were in their kitchens and their living rooms. And, um, and everybody's really, Re reacted so responsibly and, and, and sort of the camaraderie for each other and making sure they're looking out for each other has been fantastic. And so we spent six weeks doing that and then had a week off and then started in September. And so that gave us a month before um, we did our back on stage performance. And people have been brilliant during lockdown. You know, people have been very entrepreneurial, I, you know, and because we were using everything we could of the furlough scheme, they, um, you know, I was able to say to them, just do whatever, you know, we can't do it, but you do it. You know, you've got this opportunity, you're still being paid if, if there's anything you can do. So there was the disc dancing over at the canals at Hoxton, uh, which Valentina you know, and Chisata did. Megan organized an amazing gala down in Dorset. Johanna Adams organized something, our senior stage manager. So it was quite fantastic and, and to see them doing that. And that helped them stay in shape in the way they are. And so it's been still these last few weeks, months have been tough. Um, we have, you know, the, we're so big that we have to have five studios of classes. So we have one teacher in the class and then it gets relayed to the other studios, which, and then we rotate so that people get a teacher every, you know, every few days, but that's tough. You know, we're all used to being really interacting with each other. And, you know, we've got to be very careful with um, how many people we have in a room. So we did our backs to the stage gala and then these live performances are really about getting people on stage, bringing the audience in. So again, it's, it's a little bit of a gala format with some divertissements and then we're finishing each program with a full, length, a full one act ballet. So elite syncopations are then within the golden hour. And the, the dancers, you know, we have couples within the company, so they've worked well together, of course. And then, 
having had many, many talks and the companies, all the ballet companies have been talking together, but we came up for us because we're so big. The best way to do it was to create couples at work. So they worked as a couple. So the obvious example is to say Marianella and Vadim. Obviously, they don't, they're not a couple in real life, but they work well together. And so we said, well, you two will always, for now, dance together and you'll be tested. And that's the way we're working it. As the repertoire is getting bigger, of course, more and more people are joining that bubble. So um, not particularly with Marinella and Vadim, but with other groups because we're doing, for instance, monotones. Um, but maybe somebody who's in monotones is also in elite syncopation. So that opens that out a little bit because everything we do, class is socially distanced, rehearsals are socially distanced, but once we get on stage, we can't. So we are testing more and more people. And actually before the gala, we tested everybody uh, twice um, during that week. So that was 77 people, which is quite amazing. And, uh, and now we're gonna do the same for these next performances. And hopefully, of course, as it's getting darker, the clouds are getting darker in the news as well. And so we don't know where we're gonna be in, in two weeks time. And that's really unusual for us. And that's hard for us as well. Not just for me as the director and the team around us organizing everything, but also for the dancers. And, and I think, you know, any time I can, I'm always trying to give them signposts, you know, we're going to do this gala, we're going to do this, we're going to do Nutcracker, we're going to just so, and give them dates, because they're so used to working in that way that just without that feel really sort of um, stranded in this world of nothingness, you know. So I think uh, we've really, really tried to give some structure to what our plans and share as much as possible. So the plan is we're doing a Nutcracker and we're going to do it the, uh, in two acts. We're going to cut a little bit. Um, we can't have as many children, so Will Tuckett is going to recreate a new battle scene with our dancers. And uh, the whole thing will be sort of in, with, done within two hours, but we will have an interval. So after the Nutcracker, we look forward to the 2021 and please God, we're moving forward. We're getting away from as much social distancing. And I'm really excited because uh, we will present uh, uh, Dante, the Dante Project, which is Wayne McGregor's new full evening ballet. We premiered the first bit in, in Inferno in LA last year with the LA Philharmonic. It's got a wonderful score by um, uh, Thomas Addis and amazing designs by Tacita Dean and lighting by Lucy Carter, of course. And it's the first section is extraordinary. I mean, they Everybody loved it in, in LA and it's a really dancey piece as well. I mean, extraordinarily dancey. And so I'm really excited about that coming in. And then we've got many other choreographers coming in to create for the company. And so that's really important to me as well. And that's been part of, you know, that finding that balance of mix between our classical heritage, our heritage from our choreographers like Ashton and Macmillan, but then using these choreographers of today to really make a balanced program of work across not only one season, but two, three seasons. What I'm loving about the last few years in, in the job is that I actually getting in the studio more often. And uh, I, it's, and it's funny, Michelle, I don't do the sort of big calls. I mean, I go to a full call, but I will work on part of Durs and, and uh, with El Solos. So for instance, with Onyegin, you know, I was, because uh, we, it was a little bit all hands on deck, you know, and Reed had left after the first performance. So I really looked after Federico and Yasmin and, and uh, Joe Sissons and Anna Rose, that cast, and I loved it. And of course, it's an extra sense of being involved in seeing that progression of the characters. So every now and again, I sort of feel I can try and do an arabesque or something and, uh, and hopefully not look too awful. But I honestly, honestly don't miss it at all. I, um, I'm, I think I was so lucky to have done as much as I did. And, you know, I had as good a career as I could possibly have had, uh, you know, uh, for me, for my talent. And so I think, you know, it, I think it's really great if you can finish that way. And that's what I try, hopefully, to happen in the company with the dancers. I always, I always want, wh whoever you are, whether you're this great superstar dancer or somebody that's a fantastic soloist or somebody in the court of ballet, I want, you to, I want them to have the best possible 
for themselves time as a dancer and uh, so I enjoy that but yeah and while I'm waiting for a lift I'll do a pirouette every now and again. Thank you.